Good morning, everyone. My name is Keith Whalen, Managing Partner with RPI Consultants. I want to thank you for taking the time to attend this morning's webinar on PAR Management Best Practices. Uh, this presentation was originally delivered at the request of the Keystone User Group earlier this year. I'm very excited to be able to assemble the group to deliver it. Mr. Jason Kwasnick, Ms. Stephanie Kowal, Mr. Dan Perugio to deliver it via webinar. Great presentation today. And I'm going to hand off to them in just a second. First, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, number one, this webinar is being recorded. And it'll take us a week or so to get it edited and lo loaded onto YouTube, but hopefully it'll be there for reviewing. Number two, uh, please do take advantage of the fact that uh, you know, our presenters are here and this is interactive. And you can ask questions through the GoTo uh, webinar uh, chat or questions uh, modules. Uh, you know, when we did this in, at the Keystone, there was a lot of interaction and that was super helpful. So you know, please, if you have comments, suggestions, questions, just throw them out there. And without further ado, I'll hand it off to our presenters. All right, thank you. About, we are here for Pumpkin Chunkin, about some um, part of management, best practices. And about us, we were formed in 1999. Now we're a total of 60 plus uh, nationwide consultants around the country. Um, we do a lot of presentation, and this, of course, is our team pictures and our three of us aboard. Now our agenda, first we're gonna be talking about PAR setup in Lawson. Then we'll be going on to managing PAR levels, the integration of PARs with MSCM, reporting and some best practices. And following the end of that, we'll be doing our Q&A. Now the item location versus PAR location. When you think of PAR locations, PAR locations also, besides I get an IC12, builds an ICO2 ship to location for your non-stocks, builds an RQ04 for your internal delivery addresses, for your delivery packages, and for your stock items. But when you build out your IC81, it builds an IC12 record in the background. And then you have to realize that your, all modifications are done through IC81, not through IC12. It is just a record that is viewable, but not editable. Um, and as uh, Jason mentioned, IC81 creates that RQ01 automatically. So you have to remember as part of your setup and maintenance to go back into that record and um, add that account unit so you're able to process uh, requ requisitions. Um, there's also some ongoing maintenance that needs to happen um, to make sure that you're monitoring this setup from your end users. So when they're adding a, a vendor source, uh, sometimes it, it couldn't match the vendor that you're actually uh, have a, a vendor agreement for, a contract for. Um, so it's, it's definitely helpful to build some sort of report uh, to help compare the two uh, and, and make sure that you're staying on track. Uh, another area to take into consideration is the unit of measure uh, that's built and, and whether or not that's the unit of measure on the agreement. So uh, changing your, your default issue on IC11 can really help with that. Uh, peer to pay process. Um, there's also some MSCM errors that, um, that can hold up your requisition in RQ10. So if you have a, a request for 10 items, let's say, and one of those items has an error, uh, that error will stay in MSCM. It creates an unreleased requisition in RQ10, which you then need to go view and uh, release on your own. Uh, so we've worked with some end users that have actually built a process flow that uh, will look for those errors and then automatically release uh, that requisition. But in the meantime, just um, you know, make sure you're, you're monitoring those unreleased requisitions. Uh, and you can pull from the uh, source. It will say that it came from IC83. So you can look for all requisitions that are unreleased um, that come from IC83 and make sure that they are being monitored. Now stop me if I'm wrong, but I do believe the newest versions of mobile supply chain will create the requisition and release it, but create a separate record for the error? I haven't heard that, but that would be great news. Let's, yeah, I haven't seen that either, but that would be awesome if it yeah. <laughs> I read that somewhere, and I just wouldn't, I'm not awesome. sure what version. I'll have to check that out. Um, there's also uh, unreleased agreements can cause some issues um, with requests going through as well. So making sure that you're monitoring uh, when changes are made to those agreements uh, that they're being released. And here's just an example of a, a custom report um, 
created with Crystal that was posted uh, to a LBI dashboard to help monitor them. So it shows how um, IC81 was set up and who the uh, default PO13 vendor is. So managing PAR levels. Um, so IC03 is a really, really helpful screen to utilize. Um, this is report groups. So um, most likely you have multiple PAR locations for one account unit. So you can utilize IC03 to build all of those uh, PARs in a group. And then a lot of the loss and reports you can run by report group. So that will help speed up the process. Um, and then um, here in this table are some, some canned reports from, um, from loss and an inquiry screens that can be really helpful to utilize. Um, but also don't, um, don't forget that you can pull directly from the tables in Lawson uh, to get some additional information and build some custom reports. So um, item location, item source, PO line, IC trans, your shipment details, invoice details, and also IC audit. Um, if you have auditing turned on in IC01, this can be really helpful. Uh, build some KPIs, um, you know, uh, do some troubleshooting if you've had a, a system issue. And here we have some examples of uh, some reports that have been created. So this is going through um, PAR analysis and uh, giving you some recommendations if, if uh, uh, the PAR should be upped, um, decreased, or uh, removed from the PAR cart. And here's one that's a little bit more complex, uh, showing the same similar type of information. And my favorite is uh, this one that was created for uh, item change report. So oftentimes what can happen is, uh, why isn't it showing up here? We have a freeze with our TV. Um, so oftentimes what can happen is your MMIS team is continually uh, updating records. Um, you know, you could have gotten an order exception from the vendor, um, you know, unit and measure, change, a description change, and it's very difficult to communicate that to your end users at times. Um, you may have had a process where um, you were manually keeping track of all of these, um, but your uh, materials team really needs to make sure that those labels are, are updated in the, in the areas, depending on what change um, has been made. So this report um, displays any item, um, and it's run by, um, this one here was run by an actual PAR. Um, and it will let them know anytime a description, uh, either one or two, PAR level, bin, unit and measure, or manufacturer detail has um, been changed. Um, so here it will let them know to update the label um, if they recently added it to their PAR cart, or, um, or uh, the MIS team may have made a replacement if you had a conversion. It will let them know to add a label. Uh, and if it's been removed, it will let them know to remove the label. So really, really excited about this one. If you utilize uh, Crystal Reports, just reach out to us. I'd be happy to share it with you. OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about managing your MSCM configuration to optimize um, some of your, your PAR management. Um, the first thing that you know, need to know about setting up MSCM is you need to have a loss and security group. Uh, it is required. That, that, that group is defined in your filter, uh, your MSCM configuration uh, dot properties file. And um, that group needs to be created in your RM security administrator um, and then assigned to users that are coming over to mobile supply chain. Without that group assigned to the users, they will not show up in mobile supply chain. Um, there are two levels of administration you could think of it. The first one is uh, you have your IT administrator. They're responsible for the initial install, for looking at any kind of logs, uh, any troubleshooting any errors. And then you have your day-to-day your -day administration, which is typically uh, materials management super user. And their typical responsibilities would be um, managing groups, uh, editing, adding roles to groups, assigning users to different groups, um, location management, things that would affect an end user's um, ability to perform certain tasks in mobile supply chain. You do have the ability to add a user directly from portal if they are in that loss and security group. Um, or you could add them independently from it directly in mobile supply chain. 
they, they don't need to be a Lawson user to have mobile supply chain access. Another good thing to know is mobile supply chain for requests are set up. So within the MSCM application, you assign, you could assign global access to a user or specific access to uh, specific locations, if it's by company or individual locations. And so, some good stuff to know about mobile supply chain is you have the ability to set a max order quantity. So you could order twice par, three times par. Uh, if you know, there, um, before, if you have a skeleton crew on the weekends, you could order up uh, on a Thursday or Friday to make sure that you have sufficient supplies on hand before going into the weekend and you set that up in the PAR configuration screen of mobile supply chain. Another option in MSCM is to show the quantity on order. And you can see in the little screenshot of the handheld uh, coming up on the next slide, or it's up there, um, that it, uh, if you have a vendor source on IC81.2 and you have an uh, item on order, it'll show up in that little uh, QLO box. So it's good to know so you don't uh, dupl have duplicate orders sitting out there. And another um, really helpful function of mobile supply chain is to utilize the My PAR forms. So when a user logs into the handheld to count PAR forms, it shows the PARs that, they're, that are ready for them to count. It is specific to that user. So they can select all of them and download them if they, download them, if they count them on a daily basis but they also have the ability to back out of that screen and select other PARs as well. So if they're covering for, for another uh, employee that's out, they do have the ability to select other PAR forms rather than the ones that are under my PAR forms. Okay. A, a big point of discussion, especially for new implementations of mobile supply chain, is labels. Um, it sounds very simple, but it's actually, they're, they're very be beneficial to have, and the, a lot of detail and thought goes into them. If you want to have color-coded labels, um, if you want to use the out-of-the-box mobile supply chain provided labels, um, if you do use the out-of-the-box labels, you will need a zebra printer, and that label looks like uh, the blue one up top. So that's your standard out-of-the-box. You are able to uh, customize these labels, but you could really, the customization only really allows you to change the order of the fields. Um, I don't believe you could really add fields to the, the customization screens without going in and customizing the ZPL, Zebra Printer language. There's other options out there. You could use a, uh, you could build your own database in Excel or Access, and if you have a barcoding font, which is code 3 of 9 or 128A, uh, you could create your own standard labels and a variety of labels. So it's easier to roll out different styles of labels to different departments. And there's also other software, uh, third-party software out there that costs as little as $30 to implement on your local desktop and build a label database that way. So a lot of folks like to get, get down and uh, customize labels to meet, meet their needs and requirements and show the data that they think is most important to them. Okay, a little bit about PAR counting reports. Um, in these reports, once you, it's always best practice to go in uh, at least once a day to look, make sure all of your PAR counts have been submitted without errors. Like Stephanie was saying earlier, you know, sometimes you have an, one error on a, on a PAR count and it might hold up an entire requisition. So these PAR counting reports are what, um, what shows you what made it through and what didn't make it through. Uh, Some common errors that you see are uh, the requester ID is not valid, uh, and that just means that you have some kind of um, mismatch between your RQ04 record and the requester identity that's set up in security. Unit cost, uh, unit cost required, that's really a big um, error that you see pretty frequently for new implementations. Uh, it's if you don't have a PO25 record or it hasn't been ordered or received yet, or you add a new item to your location or your item master, and it doesn't have a cost associated to that item. That will require you to go to RQ10 and enter a cost for that item the first time around. But the good news is once that unit cost is entered, you never have to worry about it again for that particular item. Another common error that you see is authentication failed on user. 
And that just requires, um, well, it comes up with a password reset. So if I'm logged into the handheld and I go to my desktop and it prompts me to update my password, and I update my password and then I go back to the handheld and try to submit account, it's gonna give me that error because I haven't logged out of the handheld and back in with my new password. So these are common errors to, to keep your eye on um, if you ever come across them. Okay, some productivity reports that come out of the box uh, with mobile supply chain do require a Crystal Reports application server. And so these reports show some pretty good information. It, uh, it shows what users are counting which locations, how many units they're counting, the time it's take, taken them to count a particular PAR, and then you could also drill down into the operator activity, which shows some more detail about that. Um, it's just a good way of seeing, keeping track of um, how, how your users are, are counting, how frequently they're doing it, and how efficient they are at, at counting their PARs. So for our best practice recommendations, um, really, uh, you know, when you're rolling this out, or even if you have it utilized uh, today, making sure that you have roles and responsibilities um, defined. So like Dan was talking about earlier, uh, making sure that um, you know, there's good communication between IT and the super user administrator and, and materials. So, um, you know, even when you're, you're doing upgrades uh, and, and testing needs to happen, it's, it's really important to make sure that you're, uh, you're on the same page and you're communicating and you're, you're testing the process all the way through. Um, you know, uh, if you're going through an acquisition and, um, you know, you're rolling this out to a new company, there's going to be um, new printers that need to be added and, and compatibility and, and uh, oftentimes they'll have to backtrack to remember how it was done, you know, three, four years ago when you originally implemented. So uh, making sure that you have a, a champion in IT as, as well as supply chain is really helpful. Um, and um, let's see. Uh, we have seen admin access uh, held in IT as well, which, um, you know, it, isn't necessarily a, a bad thing, but it can slow down the process when there's uh, new requesters added or um, new cost center access is needed for security. Um, so it can bog down the IT team when, when someone in uh, materials can uh, very well handle that and has access for those locations anyways. Um, you guys have anything else to add to that? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> And uh, making sure that you decide on a labeling solution. So like Dan was mentioning earlier, um, you, can, you can have all of these custom labels, but um, maybe you want to have more control over certain areas and make sure that you have a, a standard solution um, for your PARs, um, uh, for the labeling in those areas. Um, and it, it's, labeling sounds like an easy project. Uh, but the reality of it is it takes a lot more time than you'd expect, especially if you're reorganizing your PAR areas or inventory locations. So if you're, if you're doing this by yourself, it's a good idea to kind of budget a little bit more time for that than you would originally expect. Absolutely. Um, creating some audit reports to really help uh, make sure that you have uh, those setups in sync. So, um, you know, not only the, the areas that we talked about earlier of um, adding new items to the PARs and, and making sure that they're adding the right vendor. Um, you know, it, it also can be the administration of users and making sure that um, you have the right detail on what kind of account unit access they have. Um, I will say that MSCM tables are, are very, very complicated. Um, you know, they, although they relate back to, um, you know, Lawson, um, IC81, uh, when they go into MSCM, they're split in like four or five tables, right? So um, you can't make a quick match to what the PAR location is um, because MSCM has named it a, a, like a numbered sequence. So, um, you know, once you get control over it and have a good understanding, you can map everything from there, but it's not straightforward out of the box, but it is all written there in the MSCM tables. Um, so making sure that you have an auditing report, um, you know, maintaining those uh, each day, each week, um, quarterly, depending on what type of information you're looking to get a control of. Um, yeah. We do have some questions. Great. 
that's where we're at. Awesome. Looks like we have some questions here. Um, uh, our procurement and distributions are separate, and communication between the areas is not good. Our replenishment source records in the IC12 are not in sync with our PO25 priorities and PO13 defaults. Yeah, so custom reporting um, is definitely needed. Uh, if you have something like Crystal Reports, uh, you could create uh, that logic on your own. Also working with your IT department, um, you know, that could be done through a, through a SQL statement uh, to check for those priorities. Um, you know, some of those things could be caught in, in PO23 and worked through, but, you know, obviously the, the goal is to um, automate that and, uh, you know, make sure that you're able to have a little bit of control and oversight um, to those areas. Would and you, without yeah. having crystal reports to do it, you can do this manually just using Microsoft add-ins to pull it in and do lookups and um, access for compares. Absolutely. Um, so. Pulling from the uh, agreement table can be um, difficult at times, but if you have the right um, criteria there, that you can make it work. So it sounds like you guys are talking about getting them back in sync. Uh, second half of this question is, would you suggest not maintaining, not maintaining replenishment source data in the IC12 at all to better channel items with multiple PO13 and our PO25 records? My personal opinion, what I like to do is, I only build out, like build out IC12s for inventory stocked items, tracking flag, yes. And then, you, of course, you need to have the replenishment flags there for your IC140, 141, 142 to pick up properly. Um, but I like to see the vendor being defaulted from your agreement table so you know you have an agreement for that item, for that vendor that's active. Um, but everybody has different preferences and there's different ways to do things in Lawson. Uh, another question here, um, have they really fixed the MSCM productivity reports in version 10? Durations were wrong in version 9, apparently. Not sure so, about that. Yeah, I haven't seen anything come across um, with the durations being wrong. Um, but I know there's been a lot of updates and patches for, for MSCM version 10. So I would not be surprised if that has been fixed. And there's there's things you can do with the, the table data as well to, to create your own reports to have some more information. I know that um, those productivity reports are, are pretty limited. Um, you know, uh, I've seen uh, where you go from the, all the way from the requisition all the way to the, the delivery in the area. So. Um, I'm a big advocate for custom reports using something like, like Crystal or, or even MS add-ins uh, to try to paint a, a better picture. Okay. Any other questions? I believe. No, no, we're no. good. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out at RPI uh, to Stephanie, Dan, or myself. Um, and like Keith had mentioned earlier, after editing, this will be up on YouTube. Great. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you, everyone, very much for attending. We have another webinar at 1 o'clock uh, related to Smart Office and one at 3 o'clock today on DEPM. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Stephanie, very much.